Um, today is week number 12, and so this quarter is nearly over. And uh, we will be back in uh, primarily the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, here in just a moment. We're glad that you're here, and we're thankful for another beautiful, beautiful weekend. How many of you still think that we'll get some snow? <laughs> About 50-50, so we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we're glad that you're here, definitely, and we will get into um, our study in just a moment. Before we do, if you will bow, let's have a word of prayer together. <clears throat> Almighty and all gracious Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you, but we come boldly by the blood of your Son this morning, and we thank you so much for that matchless sacrifice. We thank you for your great word that can correct us and train us and inspire us and guide us ultimately all the way to you. We pray that you would help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see and open, honest, receptive hearts throughout the day today. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the encouragement that comes from knowing that we have brothers and sisters all over this world who have been expressing their thanksgiving and their praise to you already. And we joyfully blend our voices in, in that great chorus this morning. We express to you the thanks that you so richly deserve. We pray that you would be with us as we sing together today and, and pray together and study together and give together. And remember the sacrifice of your Son together. Help these things to focus our minds and our, our attention and our affections on you at the beginning of this new week. Help us to remember the great name of Christ that we wear throughout this week. And it is through Him that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we were back in John chapter 5 last week. Remember that we have followed Jesus down to the region of Judea. He has gone to Jerusalem for one of the great Jewish feasts. And particularly in John chapter 5, we noted how he went to one of the pools by the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem uh, in Aramaic called the Pool of Bethesda. And there at that pool was a man who was an invalid. He had been an invalid for 38 years. Jesus heals that man but one of the primary reasons it would appear that John documents that particular miracle is it was done on what day? Sabbath. Sabbath day, right? And we have said that it's one thing to do miracles up in Galilee. The one thing to be camped there in Capernaum and to heal Peter's mother-in-law and, and to have that small village, its inhabitants come and, and crowd around that little house and, and heal people several miles to the north. But it's another thing entirely to come right into the heart of Judaism and to perform these kinds of miracles in the side of the religious elite, there are going to be ramifications for that, obviously, but it's a whole nother thing to do that on the Sabbath day. John chapter 5, if you've got your Bibles open there, Jesus in verse 8 told that man, you get up, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man is able to do that. But John tells us now that day was the Sabbath day. Last week we went back in our daily Bible reading and we did a lot of the Old Testament reading about this day. And we know as we go back and we study Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, there isn't anything specifically prohibiting such an innocent activity as picking up your bedroll and, and walking on the Sabbath day. And so what was this man violating? If it wasn't the law of God on the Sabbath day, he's apparently violating something because he gets a whole lot of attention. What is it that he was violating? Traditions. Yeah. Traditions. Yeah. Not what was delivered necessarily through Moses. What he was violating were some of those later 
Jewish traditions that had uh, developed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of minutely detailed and burdensome rules defining work. This is one example that we've got up there on the screen. Uh, a code from ancient Jewish literature about the Sabbath. And this particular code strictly prohibited carrying an object from one domain into another on the Sabbath. Now, you'll never read that in Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy. That was built on the basic premise. Go back to Exodus 20. The Lord worked for six days and on the seventh day He rested. And so you also work for six days and on the seventh day you rest. But here is this man. He lives in a context where we're dealing with the Pharisees. They are, are big on ethics, big on the law. And they are very, very strict law keepers. And to make an effort to keep not only themselves but everybody else from violating what the law actually said, they would build in the language of Jesus a hedge around the law. Okay, That's the kind of context that we're dealing with. Let's go back now to Matthew chapter 12. In John 5, Jesus didn't enter into some rabbinic debate about the nature of work. Remember, He just said, My Father is working until now, and I am working. He moves on from there, okay? That kind of brings us back to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to get to the pivotal point in Matthew 12 and verse 8 when he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And we're going to continue to flesh this whole thing out. We read Matthew chapter 12 in the context of Matthew 11. Verse 28. Okay, a lot of times we'll go back and we'll quote Matthew 11, 28, 29, and, and 30, and then kind of completely separate it from Matthew 12 and verse 1. Remember, Matthew didn't write, okay, Matthew 11, verse 40, and then have a big page break and write a big 1 and a big 2 and start with verse 1. It's one long narrative, okay? Matthew 12, 1 makes a lot of sense if we read it in the context of Matthew 11, beginning in verse 28, where Jesus tells those people, You come to Me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For My yoke is easy and My burden is light. Now that's what Jesus says. You think about what you know of the Pharisees. When Jesus talks about the Pharisees, does He talk about heavy burdens or light burdens? Heavy burdens, right? Matthew 23, He talks a little bit about that. How they tie heavy burdens on other people. When we think about the Pharisees, do we think about rest or work? Think about work, right? Tireless labor. When we think about the Pharisees, we think about a yoke, but a very, very heavy yoke. We don't generally think about Pharisee and gentle in the same context, do we? Or as they are classified in the Gospels, generally speaking, we don't think about Pharisees and meek, do we? No, we think more of Pharisees and harsh, Pharisees and pride, as it's uh, presented a lot of times in the Gospels. And so it's no mistake, Jesus says this, and then we've got Matthew 12 and verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Jesus is going to make four basic statements here. Statement number one in verse three. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, 
but only for the priests. Number two. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. Number three. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Number four. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay. Kind of a difficult section of Scripture, isn't it? And we're going to get, like I said, to that climactic point in verse 8. Look at the last word of verse 7, first of all. Jesus and His disciples, are they guilty or not? He says no. He says, I'm not guilty. The disciples who are with me plucking these heads of grain as we walk through this field, they are not guilty. Okay, so that, that's our bedrock. Jesus and the disciples, according to Jesus, as the Son of God, they, they are not guilty. Now the question is, okay, how, how do we get to that point? First of all, uh, according to the charge, they say in verse 2, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. True or false? We've got a couple of false whispers. Go ahead, Dave. Well, I think it's false. Uh, I mean, the, in the Old Testament, there was provision set aside for... Uh, farmers and people not to, you know, uh, cut their their uh, you know farmland or what have you, and leave it for those that would come by and take it from. So uh, that was that was what we were all. Okay. And you know, work on the Sabbath uh, was not you know defined to the minutia detail as the Pharisees uh, prescribed it was. I mean, picking uh, sticks on the Sabbath day was in their work, you know, and so they would, they would carry it to the extreme. Okay. You know, a lot of it revolves around the definition of work. It goes back to Exodus 20. Again, God said, six days you work, seventh day you don't work. Okay? So here is Jesus saying, we're not guilty. The Pharisees are saying, you are guilty. Donna, did you have your hand raised over here? They were allowed to, they were allowed to eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, in the minds of the Pharisees, plucking that grain and and getting the seeds out of it, well, that that would be work. Now, like Dave said, we've we've got a a number of references in the Old Testament to farmers. uh, They're told within that law, you know, you, you don't clear certain areas of your field. Leave that for the poor. We've got references back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy to the, the idea that it's lawful for someone to walk through your field and to pluck grain. They just can't take it and put it in their sack. I mean, it, it gets down to that, that detail. As you're walking through the field, you can take this and you can eat it as you go along, but you can't hoard it and put it in your sack and walk away as you, you go through someone else's field. And, and, and we understand why that is what i want you to see is we we've got a confrontation boiling here okay and that's why john records what he does that's what that's why matthew records what he does here that's why mark and luke all of them document this kind of thing okay all of them document the kind of statement that we look notice in matthew 12 and verse 14 all four basically say this in one way or another The Pharisees went out after this kind of thing and conspired against Him how to destroy Him. Okay? Jesus is going to cross a theological Rubicon here. You've heard that phrase, right, before? It's a a phrase that just, it goes all the way back to Julius Caesar, a a river in Rome, and it's, it's just a point that you're passing the point of no return. Okay, that's what that phrase means. Jesus is going to cross a theological Rubicon in a sense where he he has been up in Galilee. He has done a a variety of different healings. 
Now he's come to Jerusalem. He has healed a man there at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day. Here he is in the fields on the Sabbath day. Matthew's going to record another one beginning in verse 9. On the Sabbath day. And Jesus looks these religious authorities in the eye and claims to be Lord of the Sabbath. What we've got here are the events that are going to eventually lead to his death at the hands of these people, okay? I say all of that to say this is important, okay? This is a big hinge in the story. And there's no area where in Jewish tradition has built more of those hedges than the Sabbath day. And so here's the question. How does Jesus' argument make sense? Okay, I told you there were four basic statements there, right? I mean, the, the Pharisees say, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. That's the charge. Jesus' argument number one from verse three. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence which it, it, which it was not lawful for him to eat nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Okay. That's a reference back to 1 Samuel 21. We had that in our, our Bible reading. David is being hunted like a wild animal by Saul. He comes there to the tabernacle area. There is bread there that is baked fresh every day according to the law of Moses. It's set out there as an offering to the Lord. It is the bread of the presence that sits there for the day and then when the day is over, there are only certain people who are allowed to eat that. The priests, okay? David's not a priest. So lawful or unlawful for David to eat that bread? It's unlawful, really. Jesus says it's unlawful, yeah. right? I mean, this is not situation ethics, is it? You know what that phrase means. Situation ethics says, here's the law, but, you know, the law depends on the situation that you're in. And if you're desperate, we'll go ahead and break the law. It's okay. If you're suffering, go ahead, break the law. It's okay. Do we ever run across anything like that in the New Testament? I mean, if we did, why would we be encouraged to suffer as Christians? Well, I think he's more or less saying David is doing that. I, I, I believe it uh, personally, that, and I'm open to yeah. discuss it, yeah. that there can be exceptions to the rule. Okay. Uh, for example... Uh, we're not supposed to take money out of the trade just to help people in the world. But let's just say a situation. Now, these are hypothetical, but it could happen, okay? Yeah. A, a situation where you had a person that was going to die. Right there, you know, right here, going to die. Yeah. If we didn't do something, and there was no other way to do it. Yeah. Now, the trouble... What do you do? <laughs> yeah, what do you do? Yeah. The problem is, is some people take the exception and makes that a rule. And that's when... That's when we got a problem, right? Yeah. And so what do we do with David here? I mean, it's a thorny issue, no doubt about it. And it's documented right there in 1 Samuel 21. Jesus says he did what was not lawful to do. So why, why even bring that up? David, go ahead. I don't know, Jason, I think, you know, uh, maybe there's a slightly different twisted argument. You know, here's David, their, you know, reared, revered, uh, you know, king of kings of, of, of the Old Testament. Yeah. And they didn't condemn him for what he did. Yeah. And they shouldn't condemn Jesus. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I don't know, when I read this, I, that's kind of the, the argument that I'm seeing develop out of this. Yeah. I think it's an inconsistency argument, right? I, th I think you, you hit the nail on the head. Here is David, greatest king of Israel, right? I mean, if a Pharisee thinks of a king, at the top of that list is going to be David. And they revere him, right? 
Now, Jesus says, and it, it's hard to argue. Now, wh- what you do in extreme situations, that's where it begins to get thorny. But it's hard to argue that David does something that's, that's unlawful, right? I mean, the law says do this. David does something else. Jesus gives us commentary a thousand years later, and he says, David did what was unlawful. And I think what you're going to see in these four statements is an argument that is progressing stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger this is where it begins okay if as you venerate david if you're going to go back and you're going to read first samuel 21 and you're going to excuse david and his men for doing something unlawful because they were hungry then consistency will demand that you excuse me and my disciples on the same basis Now, that's not where he leaves it, right? I mean, he's going to keep talking. But that's where we're going to begin. And that's where he begins quite often with the Pharisees. You know, this is what you say, but this is why that's inconsistent. We're going to notice that over and over and over again in these these confrontations. And again, if he just says, listen, this is what you say and you're inconsistent and walk away, well, that doesn't really necessarily teach us anything, right? That just says, don't follow the Pharisees because they're inconsistent. But what it does accomplish is, this is inconsistent and if I keep talking and keep teaching, I'm not only going to expose the inconsistency, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you the original intention of God from the very beginning. I mean, isn't that what he does in Matthew 5, right? I mean, you have heard that it was said over and over and over again, you know, don't murder. But I say to you, you, you've heard don't commit adultery. You've heard don't swear by the gold on the temple, but you can swear by these things. But I say to you, we're, we're going to note that kind of thing over and over and over again. And so there appears to be, first of all, an argument from inconsistency that gets everybody's attention, and then we're going to reason from there. Alan, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. Uh, Jason, I, I, uh, I don't see how healing a man is physical work when you're doing something new. Yeah. And that's ultimately where the clash is, right? I mean, the Pharisees, to keep people from breaking Exodus 20, had taken what God's law is and then just built these successive hedges. And the further away they got historically from Exodus 20, the more hedges, (laughs) right? And, and, And the higher it got. To the point, like we read, that, well, as far as Jewish rabbinic tradition is concerned, You can't even pick something up and move it from one house to another on the Sabbath day. Now, you're not going to read that in God's law. But we, and and we'll talk about this before we're done today. You see how human tradition warps things, right? And, And that's perhaps of utmost importance for us to see. First of all, some inconsistency here, okay? If you're going to exonerate the guilty, David, why are you condemning the innocent? Verse 7, okay? That's the first question, okay? Second statement in Matthew chapter 12 and uh, beginning in verse 5. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless. What kinds of things would the priests under the old law of Moses do on the Sabbath day? What were they expected to do? Sacrifices. They would offer sacrifices. The bread would be break. This bread of the presence that we're talking about. That would be carried from wherever it's baked and it would be put on the, the table of showbread right there in the temple variety of different things that those people would go on. Now, true or false, in the eyes of God, were they profaning the Sabbath day? No. Now, what is Jesus doing? He's taking the Pharisees' line of argument. He's he's using their own medicine against them, isn't He? 
I mean, for priests to do what they are doing right now in Jerusalem, Jesus would say, well, that's, that's profaning the Sabbath day. According to whom? God or them? Well, them, right? He's taking their line of reasoning and holding up the mirror here. Of course these priests are not guilty of profaning the Sabbath day. He's just strengthening his argument. It's the Sabbath day and they're doing work blamelessly. And if that kind of service lawfully supersedes the Sabbath law, what if one who is greater than the temple is right here looking you in the eye? You see how it's slowly ramping up. Now, what in the world does Jesus mean by saying one who is greater than the temple is here? To the Jew, what does the temple signify? What's that mean? Eric? God's house. Yeah, okay. God's house. And ultimately, it's God's presence, right? It's not just a, a, a building and we're going to put God's on the front of it. Uh, it. It's God's house and it is where God dwells among His people. Okay, It is the embodiment of God's presence among His people. And so what does Jesus mean when He says, someone greater than the temple is here? Had any human being ever said that? If they had, they'd been stoned, right? So what does He mean? Okay, it's Jesus. You want to see and experience God's presence among you? That's me. Now that's the kind of statement that will get him two years later on the cross. Okay? From a, a Pharisee point of view. I mean, that is absolute blasphemy in the eyes of the Pharisees. Okay? It's not blasphemy in the eyes of God because this is the one sent from God. Right? This is Emmanuel, God with us. But you follow the line of argument. You know, you're not condemning David and he was guilty according to the law. And so why are you condemning us? And then we go, you remember the priests, how they did this so-called work on the Sabbath day and you don't condemn them even though in the strictest interpretation of your traditions they would be breaking the law. But I'm here to tell you that someone even greater than the temple is here. And if the priest can be over there at the temple complex doing this kind of thing and not be breaking God's law, if there's someone greater than the temple here, then what does that say? is the line of argument, okay? Number three, a scriptural argument from Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. Matthew 12 and the seventh verse of the chapter. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. I think that goes back to what Alan was bringing up. Hosea, ultimately Jesus using Hosea, declares God's concern is with helping men, right? The showing of mercy. Is God more concerned with helping men, showing mercy, or breaking man-made laws? Mercy every time, right? I mean, you put in a scale, a holy, righteous scale, helping People showing mercy or breaking man-made laws and it's going to go like that every time. Right? That's the point of Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6 ultimately. You're condemning the guiltless not based on the old law of Moses but on your own human traditions. And then he follows it up by saying the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. When we read the word Lord, what does that mean? A Lord is 
someone with what? Power. Authority, right? Does this mean, well, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, and so He's just going to arbitrarily violate or redefine the Sabbath whenever it suits Him? You keep your hand there and you go back to Matthew chapter 5. If we take that approach, we go back to Matthew 5, if we take the approach, well, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, and so He's just going to arbitrarily violate this or redefine the Sabbath law whenever it suits Him, how do we take that in light of what He says in Matthew 5.17? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on from there. Is Jesus just stepping on the scene and, and just blatantly violating the Sabbath and holding it up in the Pharisees' face and just mocking them as He does it? No. No, no that's not at all what He's doing. But what He is doing is saying, this is what God said, and this is what God meant, and this is how it's been perverted, and I will not submit to the Pharisees' perversion of the law. You know, what happens? Let, let's just think this through. What happens if Jesus comes, and not only does He keep the law of God, but he follows the Pharisees every lead. You know, the Pharisees come up and say, you can't do that. It's not lawful to do that according to our traditions. And Jesus says, okay, sorry about that. And, and not only does that, but teaches everybody else to do that. How, where does that road end? He would be putting the traditions of man at the same level as the commandments. Of okay. One of the big things Jesus comes and proclaims is freedom, right? Liberty. And that's going to echo throughout the rest of the New Testament, especially in the writings of the Apostle Paul, right? What is Paul able to write to the Galatians, let's say, don't let anyone judge you in regard to Sabbath keeping or circumcision or any of these other things. Is Paul able to say that if Jesus kept not only the law of God, but all of these human traditions as well? Suddenly, I mean, things are out of harmony, Right? But Paul is able to say those things because Jesus isn't going to be confined by this, these man-made rules. Dave, go ahead. So, Jason, I, I think, you know, Jesus makes a pretty bold statement here. Yeah. He's Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's a pretty bold claim. And, you know, what supports that? What evidence is there that supports that? Well... He has the power to heal. Yeah. And he healed on the Sabbath. I yeah. Mean, how do you argue against that? I mean, and, and then, you know, the words that he used here, I mean, he basically twisted their, their you know, uh, logic into illogical. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and really showed how it contradicts what God had actually laid out as the law. Yeah. And that goes back to what we've talked about the last several weeks, the purpose of these miracles, right? I mean, you take this teaching that just blows people's minds and then you supplement it with a miracle that no one can dispute and you've got a pretty good formula there for change, right? I mean, not only does Jesus say, I am Lord of the Sabbath, I instituted it. Okay, I'm Lord of it. I know what it involves because I was there, right? I'm the source of that. I know when it's violated. I know when it's being perverted. He says that and then he's able to do a healing on the Sabbath. Now how are we going to argue? Right? And the point is, as far as the Pharisees are concerned, they're not going to argue. They're just going to seek to destroy him. Okay? You see how miracles and strong teaching force people to make a choice. Who is this Jesus? Either I can't argue with what He has said and done, or I'm not even going to try, I'm just going to try and destroy Him. Okay? Last note here, we've probably got 30 seconds or so. I want you to see the danger behind 
human tradition. Okay? Tradition in and of itself is, is not inherently evil. Okay? But how very careful we need to be in handling human tradition. And in telling other people, if you want to be right with God, not only do you have to do this, but you've got to follow the, the outline of our hedge around this. Okay? A good practical point to take out of that. Tradition in and of itself it can be very helpful. Right? Especially in teaching successive generations. We just have to be careful to remember what's tradition and what is divinely inspired revelation. Okay? Thank you for being here. We'll continue to wade through this, Lord willing, next Sunday morning.